I'm Lorraine Betty Lewis Corey, and um, I've lived in Jacksonville my whole life. First generation here from home, Syria. My grandfather came, his name was George Bashera. He came in like 1907 and went to Detroit, Michigan because there was work there in the auto factories and it was easily accessible to get there. Lived with his older brother who had come before him. It wasn't until 1913 or maybe 1912 when he brought my grandmother Annie and her baby daughter, who was seven, uh, who became my mother. And they came without knowing one word of English, either one of them. Came on a 14-day trip, came through La Havre, France, and to Mama it was very exciting because she was always interested in everything. And she said when they landed in New York, it was like being in heaven. And they went and lived in Detroit for a while, and uh, my grandparents started having children, but the weather there was too cold for them. So they moved south and came as far as uh, Ocean Way, Florida. One of my daughters tells me that my grandfather should have gone about 10 miles more and ended up in Ponte Vedra, but he didn't. <laughs> so we were in Ocean Way for all of our lives. And may I ask you, is that the Ocean Way that's now just a community of Jacksonville? Yes, it okay. is. It's on, on the north side off of US 17, and um, we had acres of farmland, uh, and my grandfather opened a grocery store here in Jacksonville. My mother and my father had an arranged marriage, which uh, my uh, father's older brother and my mother's grand, my mother's father, were good friends, and they, when they were young, made the plans for them to be married. My dad didn't come over until he was 21, and um, uh, learned to live here and enjoy the country they moved to. It was a pleasure for them to live here and be free and to come and go like they wanted. Have they ever told you anything about the old country and the limitations there, or do you know anything about that? The only thing I know is that my grandmother and my mother lived with her relatives uh, while my grandfather was here, and their living was very simple. They went out daily and milked cows. They went out daily and got their water. And they had a very simple life there. But it was a happy life. They had family around them. They were well taken care of. And they were a safety in numbers there to, when the women were together. Because most of the women were still there waiting for their husbands to come and establish a, a home or a business and prepare the way for them to come. To the United States. To the United States. And so it was a simple but happy life. So what was drawing them to the United States? The opportunity of? The opportunity of a freer life, a freer choice of what you wanted to do or not do, freedom of uh, your religion that you could believe any religion that you desired. And they didn't have the... Um, people looking over their shoulders, I would like to say, of do this or do that. They were, they felt like they had a, a freer life here, a more enjoyable life here. Other than the warm weather, did you ever hear any reasons why they came to the north side of Jacksonville, the Ocean Way area? Just that it was wide open spaces, and it was like their area that they came from a little bit, farmland and open areas and animals vegetables, gardens. Did they know anybody here at the time? They knew very few people at the time. And that was the purpose of, of forming the club. In 1912, the men formed the club. The men that had been here before formed the club and established a camaraderie of helpfulness. They helped each other. They furnished each other with uh, work ethics. Uh, the money to purchase a store or a food card or whatever they needed to do. And it just grew from that. And then the women uh, formed their club before the men did, in fact. The women formed our club in 1910. And they got together to help each other and to focus on learning the language, 
learning the ways of life here and bettering themselves, and they always wanted to do better. And they immediately began helping each other, and that led to helping other people, helping their neighbors. Now, the clubs you speak of, the men's club was initially called the Salon Club, correct? No. No? Okay. The, the club was first called Syrian American Club. Okay. And then we had a Lebanon American Club, and we had a Harms Brotherhood Club. Um, the Harms Brotherhood Club was a smaller group, but they were a very active group, and they raised money constantly, making your favorite baklava and selling that and sending the money for a church and an orphanage in Homs. And that was, that was standing until the bombing began a few years ago. And the bombing there took, took the, the church and the orphanage. So that was a century-old project, yes, at least. Yes, it was. And we continued to send money to keep them supplemented there. But the three groups, the uh, Syrian American Club, the Lebanon Club, and the Homs Club, joined forces together. The three of them uh, joined their, their assets and purchased uh, five acres on Beach Boulevard in like 1959. And that was called the Salam Club of Florida. And that is what it is today. And tell me a little bit more. When you were growing up, did you were you around people who spoke Arabic frequently? We were around people that spoke Arabic constantly. Uh -huh. We spoke it more often when we were little because that's all my grandparents understood. So we had to speak it. But as we grew older, we kind of drifted away from it. And then the children don't really want to learn it as much. They just... You know, you could hear the bad words every now and then, but as far as learning, they didn't really want to learn. But at the dinner table, you would teach them words, teach them numbers, and tell them stories about things that have happened in the past. Of course, you were born in Jackson. I was born in Jacksonville, first generation. And tell me, let's talk about your journey in Jacksonville, where you were born, where you went to school, and... Um, being part of this wonderful culture this uh, that, that you have here, the Syrian culture, the Arabic community at large, and, and also uh, being part of the entire Jacksonville community, because you are that too. Right, we are. We've been very fortunate and blessed. Um, we have, in our family, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have teachers, we have people who... Uh, uh, give back to the community but we were we didn't know we were poor but we were and we were given so much love and attention that I don't think the poorness ever fit in but we grew up in Ocean Way we uh, didn't have a Catholic church out there at the time or an Episcopal church out there at the time so we went to the Baptist church but most of the uh, culture go to the, either the Episcopal church or the Catholic Church, or the Syrian Orthodox Church. We have many churches, and sometimes the groups will form their own little church that they're used to from their home to keep it very homey-like. On my grandmother Bashira's side, I have a, she has a cousin who was a cardinal with the Pope and just passed away a couple of years ago. So we have Baptist preachers, we have Catholic preachers, and we have um, Episcopal preachers, so we're we're a diverse heritage in our community. So, with your family living out in Ocean Way, where were you born? <laughs> we, <laughs> we were born at, um, I think the hospital was at Eighth and Eighth uh, and Pearl. So that would likely yes. been St. Luke's Hospital. Yes, yes. yes, and that yes. was a long time ago, of course. And some some of the families had midwives that came into the home and we had for two of my uh, siblings we had midwives and I can remember that very well and we would ride our bicycle to the church because it was we didn't have cars you know but then our biggest thrill was going to Holy Rosary Old Holy Rosary on Laura Street and we would go on Easter and Palm Sunday yes. with our grandparents and it was just a joy to see the ritual that was there but we grew up and we mixed with, with the Arabic people with weddings. We would have picnics. We had them in uh, Lake Shore area, I mean the Lake Forest area. We had them at Scaff's Dairy. 
and we would always do things that, that were in, involved in cooking, giving, selling, and enjoying really mostly. So, I was fascinated when you showed me the photograph of the club at 16th and Main Street. Right. Can you tell me anything about that club? It was before you were born, but when well, it was not established. Really. Not really? <laughs> Almost, it was. They purchased that as their first building in 1912, and it was on the corner of 16th and Main, and I believe it's still there, the big brick building, and it was a two-story structure. The bottom part we rented out to uh, businesses, and the top part was kept for club meetings and rented for weddings or special occasions and the bottom part paid for our bills paid for the monthly payments so we kind of eased into that and we kept that until 1959 oh, and when you say they purchase you mean that joint those joint groups those, that form the so, salon yes club. yes oh the Davis, the Nasrallahs the just the people that came here to begin with and just did what they could to bring others and to encourage others to come and be good citizens of this city and to give back to what the community has given to us. So you watched the the city of Jacksonville from the time it had a small uh, Syrian community to a booming, booming. Syrian Arabic booming, community. Really? Yes. Uh, do you remember when the Gator Bowl was the Gator Bowl? I and do. Everybody? <laughs> so there's just different things that you remember, but. To this day, when I drive around with my children, which I, I wouldn't drive in the city today, it is so different. It is so big. We used to have a community that went as far as University Boulevard and one way to the beach. And you just, you knew it and you spent a lot of time there, but that's as far as our city went and now it goes on forever. Do you have any re relatives remaining in Syria? We do. We have a good group of, of relatives. We write to them. We, um, in fact, I'm trying to get one of my little cousins who's named Lorraine over to visit. She's just now finished college there, and she wants to come over. So we have to write letters and, and try and get them to come over for a visit. But we do. We have a good deal of family. My dad's family have um, uh, an almond farm there. They raised almonds, and they had a grocery store in Sear, in Homs, which was, of course, destroyed. So they've gone to live in the, in the farm now and away from the city. So it's a different way of life for them now. When you're, of course, with your family here and growing up here, talk about your school experience and how much of your life was shaped by your uh, I assume public school experience. Exactly. Versus your cultural family life and extended family in the community. It was different, of course, because school was just a place to learn. And you didn't, you know, you knew you couldn't afford to go to college, so you just absorbed what you could. And you tried to learn how to be a good citizen and you learned how to be uh, take advantage of what you could learn and read and keep and help others with. But the cultural part, the Arabic part of it, was uh, going to weddings, going to the picnics, going to the dances and learning and listening to Arabic music. Even though you don't understand everything they're singing and saying, you can feel you can feel the, the, the spirit of the music, and you can feel the attachment to it, and you know it's part of your life. And it was all, we had a little bit of everything. So in, in a way, it made us well-rounded citizens. We had a little bit of joy, a little bit of sadness, a little bit of fun, and it was, it was an interesting life. Were you good friends with, uh children who were outside your culture. We were, yes. because, mostly because you couldn't drive, you know, you didn't have transportation to go far, so you played with your neighbors and you learned who they were. And some of them were good neighbors and they didn't look down on you because you were of an ethnic group. They accepted you for who you were and we accepted them for who they were. 
Where'd you go to high school here in Jackson? I went to, let me tell you, I went to school in Ocean Way. I went to school at Eastport. I went to school at North Shore. I went to school at Kirby Smith and ended up at Andrew Jackson High School and enjoyed every bit of it. But we, we were bused from Ocean Way to North Shore and to Kirby, and it was, it was something we expected to do, but we did it. So when you say you lived in Ocean Way, can you give us more the geographic location in Ocean Way? Because that's a big area. It's, it's a big area. Booming today. Booming today. My mother would not recognize oh. Ocean Way. She would not. And she prayed for the Dames Point Bridge. She got And it. she prayed, <laughs> prayed for the property that's yeah. by the airport where there's a beautiful river. Uh, a station out there that has every kind of store you would want and that just amazes me to see that because we had a five and dime that was a one woman that owned it next door to her home on Main Street and that was it you know that's where we'd run up to the store and then a grocery store finally came when Ocean Way had when Dixie built out there we just thought that was amazing but now you've got Ocean Way, you've got uh, the big schools out there now, and just, it's amazing what, what this city has done. What year did you graduate from Andrew Jackson? I graduated in 1949 from Andrew Jackson. Tell me about your life at Andrew Jackson. What were you involved in? What did well, you study? <laughs> so what track did you I take? Wasn't, I wasn't a very smart student, but I loved, I, I worked on the Oracle, which was the yearbook, and I did, you know, different activities that way. I wasn't good athletically, but I did enjoy school. I did enjoy school. And my mother would read everything that came into her hands. She wrote for the newspapers. She wrote poems, and she just insisted that we read and learn and go to church. So she wrote for the Times Union and Journal from time to time? She did. What, she did. Was she just submitted or did, was she... She, uh, she had one, she had an article that was called The Babbling Brook oh. in the time in the uh, Jacksonville Journal and she would write different articles for the Times Union. And did she use her actual name as the byline? She worked which was? Mary Bashira Lewis. So we can find those. You can Babbling find her Brooke, somewhere. Mary <laughs> Bashira Lewis. Lewis so. She's there. Sandy Strickland can help you find it. But anyway, she was in the Bible. We read the Bible every night. In your home? In our home. And we had prayers every night in our home before we went to bed. By the kerosene light, of course. You grew up with not with, without electricity? Without ele well, electricity didn't go that to far. To Ocean Lake. So what year did you finally get electricity oh, out gosh. there? Oh, gosh. Were you gone or were you there? No, I was there, but it must have been in my late teens. I can't remember exactly when. So still while you were in high school, perhaps? Probably. But we had, you know, you had, um, no. No, <laughs> you don't no want to know, that, I, I don't know that we didn't have indoor plumbing and whatever. No, I would, but that, that would make sense. So we you had outhouses. Right, right. Uh -huh. And, and uh, pumps and a well. Mm -hmm. And we had cows and chickens and ducks and pigs. What kind of stove did she cook on? Cook she, on wood my stove? mother had a wood stove that yes. we had to chop wood to keep going. And she would have something baking or cooking all the time because the stove was sure. already there. When she got the electric stove, she very seldom <laughs> turned it on. Be but before she had pies and cakes and, and, you know, pastries in the oven and put enough top to keep them warm for us. And, but after she got the electricity, she didn't want to cook anymore. How many so. people were in your, your family, brothers, sisters? There were five of us children, a mom and dad. And? We all lived in a, a three-bedroom house with no bath to begin with and a living room and a kitchen. So what'd you do about baths? And We, <laughs> <laughs> we took tub baths. We brought the water in and heated So you had a tub that yeah. you bring in the yeah. water, okay. Yeah. So that was in the house though, or no? Did you have that outside or on a porch or the, the tub bath? No, it was in by the stove to okay. keep you warm, sure. you know, sure. so. It, it was, when I look back on it now, I don't know how we managed, so. And I don't know how I managed with five children in a two bedroom and a three bedroom house. And you, either, so. so let's talk about you and when you got married. Did you have any sort of 
career or work life before you married? I did. I worked at American Oil Company at 2nd and Main downtown and worked there until I had uh, our oldest daughter, Susan. And Tom was an Episcopalian, and I was a Baptist. This is your husband, Tom? Tom is my husband, 65 years and more. And um, I loved the Episcopal Church. So he took me to, which is now the cathedral downtown, and we married there. And just this last November, our grandson married there. So we have three generations of Cory men married at St. John's Cathedral. That's a great story. Now, what about you and your husband? Was that, uh, did you select on your own or was that an arranged marriage? We kind of selected on our own. He was intrigued with Ocean Way, so he would come out and the men would play football in the manure bowl out back (laughs) at my grandparents' home. But it was always family oriented. It was, uh, you didn't go hardly on dates or anything. Uh, But he's Syrian. Yes. Yes. yes he so, is. did you meet him at Andrew Jackson or something? I met way? him. No, he came into our grocery store one day. Although he had a grocery store, he came into ours and buying groceries for the uh, Florida National Guard weekend maneuvers. And uh, I was there, and he just kind of flirted, and I kind of flirted back. So. And how long before you were married? Oh, uh, we dated. I think about two or two and a half years. And you three married, years, three years maybe. And you married at what age? I was not 21 yet, and he was not 22 yet. So we were um, we were young. Now you've surprised me. You, your family had a grocery store, right? Yet you uh, sort of marveled at the Win Dixie. Weren't they competitors? And where was your store? Well, there wasn't Win Dixie when way back then. Yeah. There was. Setzers oh, or whatever. Yeah, okay, yeah. So you're right. Dixie yes, was yeah. not way back yeah. then. But we had a grocery store at 4th and Market downtown. Mm-hmm. And um, just, you know, would go there after school and work. Do so, you know if that building is still there? It is still I there. So. It is still there. Yeah. Lovely brick, red brick building, right. as I recall. Right. Yeah. It's funny because it was family oriented. We had the grocery store that faced Market Street. Around the curve in the middle, like, was a sundry store, and then behind that was a laundromat. So two brothers, who are my uncles, had the laundromat and the uh, variety store, and we had the grocery store. So it was, you know, a whole family on that one corner. And you would sometimes be at the store or work at the store? Work at the store, do your homework at the store, and then go home. How did you get back and forth by the 40s? Well, but, um, most of the time I'd ride a bus to the store, get off on Main Street and walk the three blocks. But coming from Ocean Way, my uncles and aunts, we would ride with them. They would bring us. Do you remember when your family started the business down in Fourth and Market? Oh gosh! I mean, was it before when you? It were... was before the war. So before World War Two. Oh yes, it was before the war. But dates, I can't remember right now. Tell me what you remember about uh, World War Two. You would remember, I guess, a little bit. And also, the role was there any special role of the Syrian American community? Well, the ladies did what they needed to do with rolling bandages and making food and knitting or sewing, things like that. We got involved, they got involved doing that for the community. And that helped because most of our women were good seamstress. They were very frugal and very handy with their uh, abilities to work and do things. So they were very active in helping. But the war, um, I had, two direct uncles in the Navy who were in boats out in the ocean, and my brother was in the Navy, my older brother was in the Navy. So we had people close to home that were in the service. Did your family lose anybody in the war? No, thank God. Well, I know the part of your culture that has remained so very close to you in so many Arab Americans has been your your food culture. Right. So uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, what you know of that really, I think much of it came from the old country, but how it's been adapted, how you use it today, or your, your foods have been adapted today, your culinary style. Right. Yeah. Years ago, um, the ladies would make the dough for the baklava 
by hand, and they would be in a circle, and the dough would be spread and spread and spread to make it as thin as it is, the layers to make those as thin. They would use tin cans from the theaters and place them on a double table, and the dough would be spread and put down. You mean the big round film tins? Yes. That the films came in? Yes. So they used these big tins, yes. okay. After they were sterilized, of course. Okay. And then they would butter each layer and butter and layer and butter until they got like 25 layers. And then they would put the pecans, and they would do the same thing for the top and then they would cut them, and then they would go to Ward's Bacon Company. To and the, a baking company? Ward's Bacon, Ward's. Ward's Made Bread. Do you know where Ward's was? 12th and uh, Liberty. Okay. Near uh, that area, okay. And they, the men would wait till after they baked their bread, and my husband Tom was one of them that was there, and he was just a young man. And they would take all these trays there and bake them, and, and bake them. They'd bring them back to the club. Now, the women are out there cleaning and getting things ready, making the syrup. And they would pour the syrup, wait until they could be, and they would be there most of the night. And they and then sell those. And that would be income for, to send to Syria, or needy family here. Anytime they knew of a needy family, they got help. The food, kibbe is probably our most prominent food right now. Tabbouli, hummus, pita bread. Now, that hasn't always been popular, but lately in the past few years it has been. And you can make all those things in different shapes and forms. Kibbe is, like I said, one of the most popular. But your pita bread makes delicious sandwiches. The baklava is delicious. They use farina and make another dessert. And our uh, hummus is just every day, everybody eats hummus, though. In, in Jacksonville, uh, you used to have so many places that we you did. could go to, to get we did. Arabic food. Today, still places, but, but less. There's still places, so, yeah. and the ones places that are there are good, mm -hmm. but people are making them learning how to make it more at home. And, you know, you can buy hummus in the grocery store, I think. You can buy tabbouleh at Costco or wherever. So it's really grown a lot in people liking it and wanting it. At first, I don't think people want to try it because it's ethnic, you know, different, whatever. But that, it's that way with all cultures. They don't always come out right away. They have to grow, acquire a taste for what we make and do. So, Have you visited Syria? I haven't. I should have, but I haven't. It was never on my list because we couldn't afford it for one thing, and then when we could afford it, it was uh, troublesome to walk or whatever. But we've kept in touch. My father kept in touch with his family. My mother kept in touch with her family. And it's, it's, it's not like we've lost touch with any of them. We still talk to them. My daughter talks to them on, um, what is it, Facebook or whatever, Twitter, stuff like that. She talks to them often on there. Well, best of my calculations, you are uh, in your late 80s. 86. 86, so not, not that late. I was just trying to calculate. You, you graduated high school a little early, it sounds like, because I was running some numbers there. <laughs> so uh, look, looking at it from that point of view, uh, in your... I, I mean, your vibrancy is just infectious. It's wonderful. What do you attribute that to? Do you, do you attribute it to the culture? Do you attribute it just to your life in general? Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, I think it's a little bit of everything that, that blends in and makes you who you are. Uh, we had a good upbringing as far as uh, knowledge and prayer and God. We didn't have a lot of money, so we were never extravagant. Uh, I never learned how to just go window shop and you know shop if we knew we couldn't. But I think the closeness of your family and the love of your family and the, the backing up of your family—you know, someone's always got your back covered. So, and I think all of that makes the person. It comes into um, who you 
really are. How long did you have your parents and where did they eventually live in the Jacksonville area? Did they always stay in Ocean Way or did they? Mama stayed in Ocean Way. My grandmother was 97 and she had been in Ocean Way that whole time from when she was a young bride. Never that ventured. Remarkable. Never ventured from Ocean Way. I don't think I've talked to anybody who uh, went as far back in Ocean Way as you did. Uh, and, you know, that, that has some of the, you know, that's just an amazing piece of history. It is. Family. Grandma was 97, Sister was 97, and when she passed on, and she had only lived in Ocean Way. Did you ever hear them speak of any other families out there, families who were known in Jacksonville, the Browards perhaps? They weren't all that far out, but some were. Some were, yeah. but um, uh, Miss Swindle was out there, um, the Gillespies, who, and uh, Mama knew, you know, the Hectures and people like that. Did you know anything about these families? Like, talk about the Hectures if you know anything about No, them. you just, you, they lived there and that road was named uh -huh. after. That's what usually happened. Yeah. The road was named after, you know, mm -hmm. Moose, Sheffield, things like that, so. Did any of the Arabic families get any roads named after them that you know of? I think some of them did. <laughs> <laughs> some of them probably yeah. did. Because that was, uh, I mean, that was such a rural area. It was rural, but it, it was... It wasn't rural to us so much. I mean, we would walk to Ocean Way School to catch the bus that took us to, uh, you know, North Shore, Kirby, and Jackson, but it, it wasn't uncommon. I mean, we were used to it after doing it that long. My brother was a postman in Jacksonville, delivering mail to everybody. I worked at St. John's Cathedral for a while during the time they were building the high school and the high rises. I worked there then, and um, I worked at Cerebral Palsy for six years. And I've, I've had a, an interesting life. It hasn't always been easy, but it's been interesting. Did, were you involved in particularly any memorable events in Jacksonville's history. Uh, you would have been still very young when the war ended. I was young when the war ended. I can remember the day, though, we were on the porch at my grandmother's house when we heard that the war had ended. And we were just thrilled. And we, the kids, we didn't really know why we were thrilled, but we were, the parents were thrilled. And we knew the boys were coming home, and that made a difference. And you really didn't have radio, did you? We had a did radio. You? Okay, you we did. We had a radio. And so you, were you able to listen to reports about the we war? Did. And, we did. And so you remember we gathering did. around There the radio. were Arabic families in Ocean Way also. Mm -hmm. But it was funny, when we were young, the people, our friends in town, our acquaintances in town, would drive to Ocean Way like a day outing. You know, they were going to the country, and that's what they did. They would come and sit in the country. Is there anything that you'd like to tell, special memories about your life in Jacksonville, growing up in Jacksonville? Anything you can think of? Well, well let's just talk for a minute about your children then. My children. Your children. We had five. Susan retired from the JEA. Angela was our state attorney and a prosecutor. Uh, Tom is a businessman, has his own several businesses. Uh, Kathy has a business of her own, and Marla works at the Cathedral Day School. And all of this came from two parents who didn't go to college, right? right? But high school, but not We college. finished high school. Tom should have gone to college. Uh, when he retired at 50, I tried to get him to go and take some classes, but he wouldn't. But we were bound and determined to, to have the kids go to college. So where did your children grow up in Jacksonville? We where did you live? In, in the Inglewood area off of, uh, off of University, San Susi area, and they all went to Hogan Spring Glen on Beach Boulevard. They went to um, um, Southside Junior High, and then they went to Inglewood. And the girls went to FSU, they went to uh, Florida, and the junior college. And it, it's been, it wasn't easy, but we really tried to give them a good education, and it's, it's made them good citizens. You mentioned earlier you weren't even sure how your family was raised, and forget that the house had, what were all the modern amenities at the time, but you were talking about 
a couple of bedrooms or something. Tell us about the house your children grew up in. We just had a, a three bedroom, two bath home and with five children it wasn't easy, but they shared. They knew they had to get their homework done because we used that same table that we had dinner on. So they were good together. They all kind of helped each other out. Uh, they didn't have cars, but when they did they would let their siblings use them also. and. And they shared, and it made a big difference in their lives, in our lives. It made it, we couldn't afford a lot for them, but we tried to give them what was necessary. And we took them to church every Sunday. They were at St. John's Cathedral in the second pew every Sunday. Second pew. Are the you still in the pew. second pew? We're still in the second no pew. No kidding. Uh, tell me, what would your husband do all those years? What would you do all the years? You were a mother, I know that. Well, I managed Catherine Stout Shop. For, wow, for cat- twenty for twenty years, I worked for Catherine Stout Shop. From what year to what year? Roughly? I worked uh, from nineteen seventy to nineteen ninety, and I only stopped working then because we had a grandson that his father and grandfather wouldn't let him go to a daycare. So, Situ went and took care of the baby all week. And Catherine Stout Shop was downtown, wasn't no, it? No, we were I'm sorry. we were at San, we were at uh, Southgate Plaza and at Norwood, and now we're only out in uh, the very re- River City Station now on the north side. But it was a good career and I loved doing it. But Tom worked for the JEA for 27 years and retired from there. What and did he do for JEA? He was the manager for um, the electricity, handling all the bills and statements. And You've known a lot of people from uh, the Arabic community who've made significant contributions in Jacksonville. Can you, you, can you mention any of them you we know do. or you know of and worked with? Well, the, uh, the Dimitris were very good people here. Uh, the Nasrallahs, they've all, a lot of them have had big businesses. Uh, McCool's Tobacco Business is a big place. And the grocery stores that they've had, they've had neighborhood grocery stores. Uh, Mose and Sadie Mead had a store on the corner of Oak and Osceola, and they would deliver to their customers. And peop- our people would make it easy for you to shop with them and make it pleasant for you to be there. We've had uh, owners of five and down stores, different areas of. Uh, we were talking about the film cans. One of our men used to run the films at the Florida Theater, so. Do you remember who that was? Yes, it was Mr. Yeager, so. Was it? Yes. It was his first name? I, I'm not sure, is that Arthur? I'm not sure, not sure. The, yeah, one of yeah. the Yeagers, and he would bring, he would uh, run the films down at the Florida Theater. But they've been in all sorts, all facets of business. And, and contributing to the community. Of course, in government as well. In government, my word, Tommy Azuri, and uh, we've had a lot of them, and football players, baseball players, lawyers. You can't find a finer lawyer than Mose Mead or Ed, Eddie Farrah in this area, you know. And it, it's good. My, my own daughter, Angela, you know, growing up with, with hardly anything to become a student first woman state attorney elected, so it, it's perseverance, really. Was she the first female state attorney in Florida? Elected. Elected. In, yeah. I see, elected. Others have been appointed, uh, appointed but she was the first elected. Well, I, I welcome you to add anything else to this interview. It has been delightful and insightful. Anything else you'd like to add? The only thing is that we do try to carry on our heritage. Uh, we don't flaunt it, but we do enjoy it. And we do have um, uh, periodical uh, periodic uh, picnics where we open the club to everyone to come in and eat and enjoy themselves. We have uh, some concerts, Arabic concerts sometimes. And we have a, we belong to the Southern Federation, which is mostly the Southern states. And we get together twice a year if you want to go to the conventions. And that's where a lot of our young people meet each other at these conventions, and they get to know each other. Uh, sometimes it's you know far away or not so far. What are marriages like uh, among uh, 
uh, Arabic offspring here in the area, do they tend to marry other people of the same culture, or is it just diverse? It's all over the place. I think it's all over the place. It used to be, you know, when I was young, you didn't, you didn't date much. And you just kind of went in a group, and the group was mostly of your own. But uh, nowadays, they have—they're out in the business world. They meet different people. They travel. You know, it's not like when I was young. You went from your sleeping with your sister, sleeping with your husband, and that's it. You know, <laughs> nothing in between. No apartment. No yeah. car. No. But thank God that the kids nowadays have a, have more advantages and they have better choices, and they can make their own choices. Lorraine Corey, I want to thank you for a delightful and insightful interview. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you.